Hello, everyone, and thank you so much uh, to Valentina and Anna for the invitation to speak today. Um, so my name is Inge Boudewijn. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Northumbria University in Newcastle, uh, and I'm currently working on the Reclama project, harnessing Afro-Ecuadorian women's heritage. So this is a decolonial transnational feminist research project uh, that has taken place almost entirely during the pandemic. Um, so today I'll talk you through um, some of the successes, uh, but also discomforts of, of, of working on this research project in that context, as well as kind of generally um, so far. Um, so the purpose of the Reclama project is documenting the, the heritage of Afro-descendant and Black women living in Esmeraldas province on the north coast of Ecuador, which is highlighted here on the map. Uh, so what I'll talk about today is first a little bit of context to the project and the province of Esmeraldas, um, then a bit about our methods and methodology, and then sharing some more specific reflections on, on the challenges and, and successes of, of working towards our aims of, of a decolonial anti-racist and feminist research project. Uh, before I do that, uh, a bit more about the research team. So uh, as you can see, we're an international all women team, um, all with kind of different roles and interests and, and strengths, um, including activists and, uh, and interdisciplinary academics drawn mainly on uh, geography and history. Uh, so specifically, you see me here uh, with two other colleagues from Northumbria, Katie and Hillary, um, three colleagues from the Esmeraldas based Afro-Ecuadorian feminist collective, Mujeres de Asfalto, uh, which are Juana, Claudia, and Nietzsche, and then uh, three colleagues from the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito, uh, Sofia, Antonia, and Belen. Uh, so for a really quick context to the project and the province where it takes place. Um, so in contrast to much of the rest of Ecuador, the region of Esmeraldas has a high percentage of, of Afro-descendant people with about 50% of people identifying as such. Uh, which in some regions goes up to about 80%. Um, and inequality in Ecuador remains high and, and the population in Esmeraldas remains marginalized on several fronts, um, including in terms of access to education, drinking water, healthcare, uh, and all of these, of course, exacerbated in the context of the pandemic. Um, they also live with the impacts of environmentally and, and socially damaging resource extraction. Um, a 2017 report to the UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination uh, described the Afro-descendants and indigenous populations of Esmeraldas as experiencing, um, quote, a situation of exceptionally grave emergency and violation of rights due to the uncontrolled impacts of mining, palm oil cultivation and forestry. And obviously there are gendered aspects to this. We know from contexts all over the world that women and girls suffer disproportionately the impacts of resource extraction while gaining fewer benefits as compared to men. Um, the same UN report also described uh, systematic discrimination against Afro-Ecuadorians, um, high levels of violence, all with disproportionate impacts on women. Uh, and women also suffer from gendered and racial stereotypes, such as assumptions about Black women's hypersexuality, whereas otherwise Afro-Ecuadorian women are noted to be somewhat invisible in, in the public sphere. Um, in general, uh, Afro-Ecuadorian culture and Blackness are noted to exist kind of largely outside of the imagination of the nation, uh, which means that their stories are largely absent in, in narratives of the country's history and, and what it means to be um, Ecuadorian. So a little bit more about Reclama. So led by our partners in Ecuador, um, our starting point is to recognize um, the intimate connections between territory, memory, and identity, and also uh, to highlight the concept of ancestral territory that is built and sustained through collective memory. So the project tries to nurture and provide a resource to sustain this collective memory, um, especially uh, in an intergenerational way, um, and strengthen the struggle for ancestral territory in the face of these kind of threats of large scale extractivism that we see in the region. Um, so as I already alluded to, the project has been massively delayed by COVID, but I'm really happy that I can now share that we have actually managed to do a lot and we are in the final phases of the project. Uh, so last year, a workshop was held in Esmeraldas, where we worked with our colleagues from uh, Mujeres de Asfalto to train 14 Afro-Ecuadorian women from kind of all regions of Esmeraldas to be peer researchers. Um, 
uh, enabling them to collect oral histories from older women in, in their communities. So there is a really strong practice of oral storytelling there, but much of it isn't captured or written down and therefore it's a danger of getting lost. So it's a resource that, um, that our colleagues at the NGO really wants to capture. Um, as our colleague Juana explains in the quote, um, I believe that grabbing hold of our history at this moment is the only way to mark out a better future. They've always denied us our history, and I believe that telling it resignifies it so that we become the narrators and protagonists of our own history. Um, so the peer researchers have then gone out and collected over 60 life history interviews from women in their communities. Um, and then the peer researchers, alongside some of the women that were interviewed, came back for a second workshop where they collectively reflected on the process, on the data collected, um, and together indicated some key themes of heritage that were important to them, including um, ancestral medicine, food and recipes, aesthetics, uh, religious practices. And they're now in the process of creating um, creative outputs based on these key themes, including videos, photographs, and fanzines. And in July, all of these will be shared at a final exhibition in Esmeraldas, which is really exciting. In the, in the, I'm sorry. Uh, could you yes. uh, talk a little slowly? Oh, so sorry. That, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have had no coffee worries, no before worries. doing a talk. <laughs> no worries. All right, sorry, I'll try and, I'll try and slow down. Um, yeah. So um, going back a little bit um, to the period of, of the start of the pandemic and the lockdown where not much was possible to do in practical terms, uh, what we did manage to do in the team was um, devise an internal document co-authored by all of us, which outlines um, our aim to embed decoloniality at the heart of, of the project. So. Uh, we made a set of ethical agreements uh, together to uphold towards each other, um, as well as for our approach to, um, to working with peer researchers, uh, interviewees, and, and really everyone involved on the project. Um, and something that came forward very strongly in this document was the need to, um, to challenge the notion of what can be considered scientific knowledge, which, as we know, is primarily white, male, institutional, English speaking, um, and instead forwarding and recognizing historically excluded knowledges, um, appreciating the intellectual and scientific work in community oral cultures. Um, within the team, we work as much as we can in Spanish, uh, and we aim to create outputs in both English and Spanish as much as possible as well. Um, then while we don't avoid difficult subjects, the project is also committed to capturing uh, narratives of joy, endurance and happiness uh, and not perpetuating the, the image of black women as victims, which has been repeatedly emphasized by, by our colleagues in Ecuador as well as being of great importance. Um, we're trying to make space for a process rather than just looking for an outcome, so ensuring that the research is shaped uh, by its Afro-Ecuadorian participants and kind of led by the objectives and agenda of uh, Mujeres de Asfalto. So they hope that by collecting the oral histories and, and creating these uh, creative outputs, we can contribute to the process of redefining Afro-Ecuadorian women's history and also um, preserving it for the future through, um, through creating a community archive. So for example, we left the content of the creative outputs intentionally very vague for, for as long as we could. Um, and they were then decided on by the participants during the second workshop um, and by their drives and interests. So they selected both what they wanted to portray, for example, recipes and food and, and how they wanted to portray it, for example, through uh, video and photographs. Um, but of course, um, creating a, a transnational decolonial feminist research project isn't easy and discomforts do occur. So some brief reflections on that. Um, we did take a lot of time to, to kind of reflect on our own positionalities within the team and, and what this means in regards to how we work together and how we approach each other, but also recognizing how we are perceived beyond these spaces and, and there's things that um, we can challenge but not necessarily overcome. 
um, also recognizing kind of the individual and, and never completed work that goes into trying to decolonize yourself and your practices and, and, and trying to do better. Um, so we try to work horizontally and collectively with, with the purpose of creating spaces of trust and care and, and co-creation, um, which includes having uncomfortable conversations um, about expectations and needs and understandings, which obviously sometimes contrast or clash. And um, there are inadvertent misunderstandings as well, which is inevitable as we're working between academic and activist spaces, uh, between disciplines, backgrounds and races and languages and, and locations. Um, and also, well, we've got this kind of lovely set of objectives and agreements that we've made together and, and we're all happy with. Um, and, and we've set well forward the ways of working of, of Afro-descendant women and, and not those, you know, that those of us at universities are necessarily used to or, or comfortable with. We do continue to be bound by protocols and bureaucracies uh, linked to kind of institutional expectations of, of what it means to do research. Um, for example, in ethics procedures, the need to supply beforehand so much information about what you're going to do, uh, which is necessary before you can start, that's, that's really an obstacle to co-designing things with the participants as you go along. Um, and for example, the notion of, of informed consent has been critiqued for taking its starting position in, in the individual uh, kind of reproducing and normalizing the hegemony of, of Western ways of thinking. So decolonizing research also includes difficult conversations about these practicalities and, and ways of working and, and, and budgets. Um, and then another thing due to COVID, the UK based team have not even been able to visit Esmeraldas at all so far. So ideally we would have already have been there several times. So at the workshops, for example, we're only uh, able to be present virtually and, and our colleagues on the ground, they did really amazing work in pulling everything together, but it's a higher burden than originally anticipated um, for them to have to do work that we expected to kind of do all together. Um, and the added context of the pandemic for them as well, which implied extra regulations, extra concerns on top of everything else. Um, obviously, all the usual difficulties of working remotely and connections and, and delays and um, but most of all, there's 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 the discomfort of, of talking about a place that I haven't actually been able to go to yet. It's a really kind of awkward position um, to be speaking from. Um, so quickly, um, something I think that we can do in, acad uh, in academia. Uh, and here in the UK is to take steps to try and start pushing some of those institutional boundaries, which is what, uh, what we've tried to do. Uh, for example, we shared that internal ethics document that was ours um, with the universities alongside our regular ethics applications, which covers all these discussions of uh, individual versus communal ownership of knowledge, uh, the need to prioritize the Afro-Ecuadorian community's wishes and visions and practices of oral histories. Um, we're collecting oral consent rather than written, which is uncommon at one of our universities in particular, which in discussion with the partners we consider to be um, more appropriate for the context. Um, we also want to recognize the importance of ownership of the oral histories and, and other outputs, so giving participants the choice of whether or not to be named in relation to, to these, uh, rather than anonymizing them by default, which again is usually expected by, by the institutions that we work for. Um, and as I already mentioned, the collective collected oral histories, uh, they will go into a permanent archive owned by Mujeres Asfalto on behalf of the Afro-descendant community. So ensuring their continued communal access to these stories uh, and participants do have the choice to opt out of having the research team uh, use their oral histories for any academic or other purpose, in which case it will just be archived uh, for the community and we don't have access to it. Um, we're also planning to publish some podcasts from selected, uh, selected interviews online, of course, with explicit permission, um, which represents a further deviation from, from anonymity, instead reflecting the notion of oral history, again, as a communal resource that is so important um, to Mujeres Asfalto, as well as uh, the right for stories to be shared as they were told rather than interpreted um, by us. 
Uh, finally, some ongoing reflections and questions uh, going forward. Since I'm, I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll be really brief on, on those. I think there's a lot more to be said and explored in relation to working across spaces, uh, how to balance the misinterpretations that may occur and, and you know, further conversations about decolonizing every step of the research project and, and what that really means and, and ensuring they are truly shaped by, by participants. But uh, before I sign off, I just want to draw your attention to another quote by Juana, who says, um, for a project to be really decolonial, uh, it must be fully transparent about information, what will be done with it, how data is collected, what is left in the communities, and how we leave these communities. I think the only way to create a different process is to position ourselves as equals, to recognize we all have diverse knowledge and that this diversity will allow us to build something different in social spaces. Everything will flow differently from there because when you find yourself among equals, there are no unnecessary silences, only sincere questions and necessary answers. Um, if you're interested to know more, we do have a Facebook and a Twitter and a website with blog posts, but I can pop those, uh, those in the chat. Uh, we also have an uh, open access article published in English and Spanish, and you're always welcome to get in touch with us as well, of course. Uh, so I'll stop sharing now and just say apologies again to, um, to the translators. Thank you so much for your, for your work and apologies for speaking too fast, uh, but that's it for me. Thank you so much. That that presentation uh, was something. <laughs> it was it was brilliantly done and exciting work. What uh, so coming from India and and working with local communities as well, I I can see some parallels from your work and and the work that we do here as well. And and one major uh, takeaway for me is drawing out of these local experiences and lifting up voices. I mean, that is so critical to dismantle existing structures and, and power equations, not just within academia, uh, not just within knowledge brokership, but also in the larger society, because you also spoke of communications tactics, like uh, publishing of podcasts and and putting these very critical stories out there for everybody to hear and see and reshaping of the narrative, so to speak. Thank you so much. Um, now we should move on over to Andrea. Over to you. Hi. Inge, it was amazing to see that you're working in Ecuador. So this is basically decolonizing the academia from Ecuador to the world. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, um, I'm going to share my start sharing my presentation. Can you see my presentation now? Correct. Yes. Okay. So, uh, working on this presentation, I have been asking myself about decolonization, what it means to my uh, in my context for my work, as part of my research and teaching practices. As an early career academic working on topics related to indigenous women and women's rights in the Andes, decolonization is everywhere. That is important to the extent that it doesn't transform into a buzzword. Understanding the coloniality allows me to question and learn about the intergenerational consequences and violence resulting from a colonial history, a history of colo colonization. Uh, furthermore, thinking about decoloniality allows me to value the knowledge produced from the colonial wound. Uh, I don't know how to move on. Yeah, from the colonial wound. Um, as Walter Mignolo presented the idea of learning to unlearn and how that confront us researchers and teachers with the necessity of delinking from a naturalized idea of society, that it's Eurocentric, heteronormative, patriarchal, racist, extractivist, and white. In this sense, the contribution of the colonial uh, thinking to transforming what we see, experience, and talk uh, about the world is immense. Uh, still, its practice is complex and require a great level of commitment and a constant urge for self-reflection and criticism. 
especially when these practices um, are implemented by someone whose experience is not defined by epistemic oppression, by, uh, but on the contrary, that have benefited from colonial power structures. So for this presentation, I want to focus on my journey in understanding the importance of the colonial thinking and the colonial feminism. I want to start talking about my positionality, my ignorance and my process of learning from others and the academic gains I have gotten from this journey. Hopefully the narration of this experience beyond the anecdote could stress the relevance and challenges of the coloniality in practice. I am an Ecuadorian woman who grew up in an urban area in a lower middle income household. Even considering the lack of resources within my home, I went to a school that taught English. I won a scholarship that a participant could only win because of having a specific English requirement. And because of that, I finished my MSc and my PhD in the UK. My experience growing up in Ecuador made me a privileged Blanco Mestizo woman, a position that changed when I moved to the UK and became a Latin American immigrant woman, a still privileged, by now part of a rational racialized minority. This context deeply affected my perspective as a researcher. For my PhD, I started a project um, to understand how indigenous women that have experienced intimate partner violence navigate a plurilegal system, meaning a system that accepts two or more systems of law. As I started preparing for my fieldwork, I encountered a limited portrait of indigenous people's experiences. That is a narrative surrounded of what is authentic, a portrait of fearless activism, or an image of systematic oppression and poverty. Added to that perspective, I had my own limited reflections on positionality. I considered uh, at this point of my research that I will be able to empathize, em yeah, to build a connection with indigenous women based on my gender or our shared language because I was working with a bilingual community. And our understandings um, of the failure of the state and the legal system. So we will have these things in common. I was going to be able to ask questions and understand. While I had a commitment of caring and respecting the people that I would interview, I did not understand how my approach perpetuated a clear power dynamic. That is, I will go and take what I needed, in this case, information, based on my understanding of what gender power dynamics were. I thought that, to a certain extent, I understood the dynamics of gender oppression that would appear when approaching women. Now I can see I, how I was homogenizing women's experience, indigenous experience, and the experience of victims of abuse as if somehow history, geography, cosmology, and community will not profoundly shape this experience. My first lesson learned about uh, implementing the colonial thinking resonated with Maria Lugones' explanations of, of the methodology of the coloniality. I think of the methodology of the coloniality, she said, I move to read the social from the cosmologies that inform it, rather than beginning with a gender reading of cosmologies informing and constituting perception, embodiment, and relation. As a result, I learned to appreciate the experience, the knowledge, the narration of the people that I am working with and learning from, not imposing on prioritizing my gender perspective over their actions and dynamics. In the case of my research, one key example of learning from indigenous experience and narrative and not imposing gender perspective on cosmologies could be better understood by listening of people's explanations about violence. During my stay in an indigenous community, I asked my host's family questions about the frequency of violence within households and women's experience of abuse within the community. My host replied with a complete denial of violence as a problem or as a pattern in the community. Beyond the social component of the denying violence, there was a much more interesting element. While I was talking about violence, referring to any mistreatment or harm perpetrated by force or related to humiliation or degradation in a short or long 
um, time towards one person, my host reference violence as an a specific episode associated with an abrupt expression of physical force to subdue someone. In this case, violence could only mean being attacked in a way that it affected the community and the social relations. As my, ho as my host and I talked in Spanish at the beginning of my research, I assume that the word violence or the expression ser violento, to be violent, um, an action will be learned or understood as an action or a behavior about inflicting pain on others. Um, and I thought that that translation will work well with um, my, my host uh, in, and also with the Quechua word. However, that was not the case. Quechua will not allow you the, the categorization of systematic um, abusive episodes, physical or verbal. Um, as violence in Quechua, the closest word to violence does not encompass different forms of mistreatment um, or violence as a behavior or a pattern. Instead, violence is translated as yankanchi or makai. This last one is to hit with the intention of hurt. In Spanish, the closest translation to, to those will be pegar, to hit. Um, the word in Quechua is a better reflection on an illegim illegitimate action than a behavior. To have a better understanding of the vernacular use of the word violence, I work with my host daughter in translating words and phrases from Spanish to Quechua to later discuss the translations. As a trilingual woman who speaks Quechua, Spanish, and English, my host daughter was able to talk me through Quechua words that would refer to the use of force. Our work started with a question, how will you say violence in Quechua? Or at the time, as I asked in Spanish, ¿Cómo dirías la palabra violencia en Quechua? She replied that violence will be yankanchi or makai, as she explained. Uh, makai is a word used when we talk about violence, that means pegar, to hit. You have to understand that in indigenous communities we use the word because we do not consider psychological violence as violence. It is only violence when the attack is physical. Yankanchi will be more related to humiliating a person. Yankanchi is more related to psychological harm. It is a word used in discussions between family or in discussions with the community leaders. This conversation allowed me to understand um, what, was, what it means to be hurt for the people um, that I was uh, learning from. I thought being hurt was something physical and centered on the body of the individual that was being hurt. However, the people I talk to place much more importance on the humiliation and place abuse in a social context. context. Hurt could be um, demigrating a person because within the household or breaking bones within the family. To be hurt was uh, experienced in relation to the family and the community, not only by the individual and the body. However, to be physically attacked was treated, and, and the idea of a physical attack will be just treated as an episode, something with a beginning and an end. In contrast, humiliation will be much more lasting and have more, much damaging effects. This understanding uh, contributed significantly to think about how women interact with plurilegal systems. For instance, how can an indigenous woman successfully engage with a system that does not understand their experience of being um, hurt um, in relation to a state violence, right? However, I must add that that explanation was no unique. Following that the explanation of this mean hurt uh, was not unique. Following that path will have led me to the beginning of my story unifying and simplifying indigenous women experience. 
as I now understand, younger generations of indigenous women narrate their experience of violence differently, partly because of the connection to other context concepts such as human rights, different versions of feminism, a more urban experience, individualized experience, or their own take on, on indigenous cosmologies. In that sense, uh, being committed to listen to other people's narrative and experience is one big part of my uh, decolonial practice. In that sense, a challenge of a decolonial practice, oops, um, a challenge of a colonial practice in the context of methods is moving beyond what I, academic, think to listen and ask to what my collaborators want to share. That also limits my academic practice. I can only take what I am offered through time, knowledge, experience, and stories. Furthermore, people that will work with me, they are sharing knowledge in an active way hence also producing knowledge because of the intention and communication of, and expression. And then, yeah, I can finish there. Thank you so much, Andrea. That, that was poignant, um, simply because I, I think the last phrase that you used was moving beyond what I as an academic think. And, and relating more to what the community thinks and resharing and sharing um, of community experiences, of including those experiences within, within research and also academia. Um, these were, both presentations were so fascinating as Valentina said, and so insightful. Um, we have ha have some space for question and answers, and I think I would now open the floor for those questions and answers. Um, I would request um, anybody who's asking a question to speak slowly for, uh, in terms of the pace of your words, uh, just for the interpreters. Also, um, I would request you to identify who the question is towards so that that uh, so both researchers can answer or either one of them can answer. Uh, yes, we have a queue uh, now. So Valentina, since your hand was raised first, let's go with you. Hi. Um, yes, I'm sorry that I immediately jumped in, but uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting on both of the really good presentations is, um, yeah, just decolonizing our practice and how we can do that. And I think also ties to the other things that we talked about, which is kind of questioning our positionality and how um, studying and also moving to a different location, I think, for, uh, for example, for Andrea and I, how moving to a new place can make you question your own positionality that you thought you had in the first place, which I think is an interesting experience. Um, but I was wondering if both of you could talk more about decolonizing the results of the research. So we talked about oral history, um, but normally academia wants to see written results in a kind of very Western, you know, published book. Um, how do we, yes, do you have any thoughts about decolonizing the results of your research as well? Thank you. I can, I can go uh, with that um, particular, so I, I think now there is a little bit more of a space to, not necessarily to change the, the results of research, but to add to them, which can be a different kind of conversation about how much pressure you have in generating results. But from the last two projects that I work, that I have worked with, so I, I'm going to share a link because I'm quite proud of, of that work. I, I work in an art-based project with King's College and, um, and a space called Arts Cabinet. And for that, um, the the final part of the project was very open was like okay you have all this space to do something and we decided um to instead of 
publish the, the result that you can see online, we decided that instead of using our names, we will create a collective. So in the collective, that's an indigenous woman, a photographer, and the academic that was, yeah, I was academic. So, but we decided to publish under a different name. So we are Colectivo El Chaquiñan. Um, and that was interesting. That also presents a different way of thinking about the horizontal idea of work. Because again, it will be not just Andrea the Academic. It also was in translation. So it was Spanish, it was English. It included the video so that it will facilitate a little bit of the conversation. So there, that, that's a little bit of extra possibilities there. Um, and very, very interesting. I am working with an amazing scholar called Antonella Mazzone. And she's working with, um, really, with technology and energy. And we are producing a paper for nature energy with co um, with peers that are indigenous activists and for that we are we decided not to interview people but instead having a long conversation and transcribe the conversation so that the particular conversation was as as Inge mentioned it in her presentation, as they wanted to be, not as I wanted to interpret it. And that was quite interesting. And I also, it was very weird to have that particular um, space in a, in a journal as Nature. And, and that is something that was also considered innovative. So there are spaces. And as and also Inge mentioned, there is a need to push for those boundaries to be moved. Um, but interesting things are happening. Thanks for these spaces, Valentina. Yes, thank you so much. I think that's that's a really great question. And, and I think the, the thing that we'll be debating a lot um, going forward in our research is we're getting kind of towards towards that point. Um, I think it, it's it's another, and as, as Andrea mentioned as well, it's another kind of site of maybe some struggles and discomfort um, and what we're trying to do. I mean, some of the things that, that we are doing is um, making that community archive that will host all, all the uh, oral histories collected, any creative outputs produced. Um, we will be sharing, for example, the videos that are taken and, and the photographs that are taken by participants um, and those podcasts uh, that I mentioned. So. Um, there are ways in which we're trying to to share the outputs in non-academic spaces and in ways that are well at least accessible for people that can go online or that can go in person to to the um, Mujeres de Asfalto uh, place where they're hosting the the archive. Um, but of course, there is you know on the other hand, there is a little bit the, the discomfort that yeah we do we are expected to create as well traditional publications um, and academic outputs for our universities and for the funders um, and, and all these kind of more traditional um, things that are considered to have impacts and, and, and show what we're doing. And there is a difficulty there because obviously when doing that you are interpreting people's words and translating them into English. Um, I think some some of the things that we're trying to do to kind of mitigate that to some extent is that we've agreed that every publication will have all of our uh, names on it, regardless of, of how much each person has actually contributed to the writing, because we know that all of our knowledge and work has gone into that that publication. Um, and we've also had discussions about kind of um, how to how to acknowledge the kind of community knowledge and, and the, the knowledge of the afro ecuadorian community that has gone into um, into that work. Um, so we have to figure out how exactly to do it. We discussed having it as kind of a way of acknowledging it as a co-author or putting it in a special acknowledgement or something like this, but we'll have to we'll have to figure out how, how that's going to work exactly. But it is an ongoing discussion. So thank you for that question. Thank you both for your responses. Uh, we have a couple of more questions, and in the interest of time, let's just take them up uh, ASAP. Sonia, over to you. Hi, thank you very much uh, for the for this wonderful presentations. Uh, I'm Sonia. Uh, I'm in, working in the academia in Brazil, 
and um, I also studied in UK at university. And I, I think something that is very important uh, about decolonizing universities from the south and from the north, uh, from the north. And uh, I think uh, something that I would like to ask you, it's about engagement of the community. Uh, when we work with life history, uh, this is something very important for, um, for academia, yes, it is, but how it is important for the community and, and the process of the engagement of, of the community. How do you think about this and how it developed in your work, if you could? share some thoughts about this. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just writing down your question quickly so I can make sure to answer to all of it. Um, so the reason for collecting life histories, uh, especially women's life histories, is that they are often not, not captured. So. Um, some years ago, um, a, uh, a man called Juan Garcia started in, in, um, in Esmeraldas to collect kind of life histories of older Afro-Ecuadorian uh, people, but a lot of them men. Um, and this was, he, he was an um, Afro-descendant person from the region himself, and he considered this to be extremely important um, because it was something that was getting lost as, as older people uh, were dying and not all knowledge was passed down um, and so things get lost in in oral cultures when they develop in that way I, I guess um, so the reason for doing it is just in 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 conversation with with our partner um, NGO Mujeres das Falto there um, for them it's extremely important to first of all capture this knowledge and especially to capture to capture women's knowledge that is a danger of, of of being lost so for them it's extremely important that it it's available um it's it's collected it's it, it can be accessed by the communities not just now but kind of in the future it's there is there going forward um does that sorry does that answer your question i was yes writing yes, really fast <laughs> okay thank you very much Um, all right, moving on to the next question. Apologies, I'm from South Asia, so I might mispronounce some of your names, and which is why apologies in advance. Uh, Naya, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. I just, first I want to start saying thank you. That is um, a very introspective research that Andrea is doing, and and I really value it because I work with myself. And I like when you talk about the concepts and this is my question is like, how do we decolonize concepts? Because you talk about the translation of how they see the world and Inge, um, in, Inge have, have you thought about how in your research you decolonize the concepts? I can I can go there. So um, I don't know that that is a that is a challenging question and it's a challenging practice. If I go very quick with that with answering, I think about not thinking from the theory but thinking from experience and embodiment, and that quite that usually for me helps a lot because they are not separated. So once are put in words in a, in a particular way with a particular language that we understand what we are trained to understand um, academic language. However, if we try to mute that chip a little bit and try to move to the embodiment and the experience of the people that we're working with, the connections start to make so much sense. And it's, it's Bell Hooks is amazing when she talks about theory as a liberatory practice, because she goes there. She said like, okay, maybe we, we, can, we need to see that these things are completely connected. Um, they talk to each other, but we have value one beyond the other. Um, but it's quite interesting to move from what we have read to listen to what people have experienced through life. Yeah, maybe that makes a little bit of sense. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I also really appreciated, uh, Andrea, your, your reflections and, and your reflection on, on this point. I think um, we are also running into things that cannot be translated easily um, and struggling with, with how to write about them. Um, but all of that, yeah, it's part of ongoing conversations and, and, and things to consider. And maybe there is no, there is no right answer, but it's definitely important to, to, well, I guess not just ensure that you're, you're capturing or trying to capture the meaning of concepts that are not translatable, but also to make sure that you have a shared understanding of the concepts as, as Andrea explained uh, so clearly in her presentation, a shared understanding of the concepts that you assume everyone is speaking about the same thing, but maybe they are not. Thank you so much for your replies. Anyway, could you unmute yourself, please? Hello, everyone, and thank you for the these very interesting presentations and reflections about what are the challenges, limits, trade-offs of trying to decolonize our own research. And one of the things that it was in my mind, I was curious that um, uh, the extent to which you didn't uh, address, although I, I, don't, I understand that that wasn't basically the purpose of, of this uh, workshop, but this seminar, but you didn't say anything about the current situation of UK higher education institutions in the process of neoliberalization. And, you know, we are here facing a huge crisis in, in, in the higher education system. And, and the way in which we can locate ourselves in this process of decolonization. Uh, which is also linked to something that Ellen John said in the morning, this idea that how you navigate through this system as a Latina um, and, and understanding that on one hand, you have to negotiate something to be in the academia, to be part of the academia. And what are, let's say, the boundaries and the challenges and the limitations of this kind of process of liberation, what kind of things we, we need to negotiate in order to be within the system, what is the price of doing that? And once we are there, how we negotiate being there, because we know, and this is that is something I've been reflecting based on my own trajectory, because uh, as a Latin American feminist scholar coming from a, a working class background and I've been seeing how the academia is, or even how the certain elite coming from Latin America is also reproducing its own privilege within academia. So every time you do just a simple exercise of looking in the background of different scholars, it's always coming from, you know, links to international organizations or coming back from very prestigious university, et cetera. So once you, we are in, inside the, the, this space, I'm basically myself, I'm currently teaching at the University of Manchester, but how we negotiate that kind of positionality in order to understand that we are part of a dynamic of a system which is quite um, racist, institutional racist, classist, elitist, et cetera, and so on and so on. That is a very difficult question, Yvette. Um, uh, oh, I wanted to say, what do you negotiate? I will tell you about my fear. I have the fear of, about being a, a talking Latin American woman. And I, yeah, that uh, to become part of academia, I will feel a space that was, that, that it's supposed to be filled by someone that can negotiate or navigate between English and Spanish and different communities. And then you will have that extra global feeling that, that uh, some universities want. And that, that is my fear. And that's something that I have to negotiate. And, and that also that fear allowed, made me more or less silent to things, to, to keep it quiet, to, to be, um, a good immigrant. I, I have this conversation several times with different people, like to be the, the good immigrant, the one that knows the rules and know how to navig navigate the rules. 
Um, I, from my perspective, the negotiation, it's, it's a hard negotiation. It's a loud negotiation. And it's also, um, I, I'm going to go na Naya now. It also needs to have a little bit of, of I need to be good with myself sometimes and allow me not to be as loud and as confrontational as I wish because you sometimes don't have the energy to go there. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I think I just hear you. I, I think it, it is challenging and it, it's a fight, but it's interesting that in places like this, you, you understand that you are not alone, that this is a, a shared struggle, that it's becoming less unsettling because it, it is shared. Yeah, thanks from, from me as well. I think I agree that it's a, a super difficult question and, and something that I've struggled with as well. Um, I think for me, I definitely have the fear that what I'm doing will in some way reproduce or or make things worse, which is why I think it's so important um, for me to really listen to what our partners have to say. And they do have um, sometimes rightfully reservations about working with academics or about working in academic spaces um, or some some distrust of, of those spaces, which is completely understandable. Um, because as you rightfully say, it is a, a neo-colonial kind of system, the, the whole higher education system here in the UK and, and in other spaces as well. So the question, um, the question is if it is possible to to decolonize a system like that or if if we're feeding back into it and the answer is I don't know but I think that um, just what I'm trying to do from my position is is just the things that I can and pushing back in in, in the ways that I can and that we set out in our presentations where we're trying to to push the boundaries of what is possible and arguing with with our ethics board about no we need to do it this way because this this is how our partners are comfortable with doing it and things like that but I mean it is yeah it is an ongoing reflection and discomfort that I struggle with as well thank you both for uh, your replies and also for the deeply reflective session um, not just that your work speaks to how committed you are to, to both your causes and the broader issue of how do you actually decolonize academia. Um, any closing thoughts from both of you or should I hand over to Valentina? No closing thoughts? No? <laughs> Great. Valentina, the floor is all yours. Yeah, no, thank you so much for those like really, really interesting discussions. And there was also a discussion on the chat kind of that came out of what we were talking about. So it was really um, inspiring. And I think like we all have kind of these fears that are underlying our practice. And it's just so amazing to be able to discuss them and think about them. So thank you again so much for sharing. That is the end of this panel. Thank you, Avantika, so much for your amazing chairing as well um, and for bringing in your perspective uh, in your commentary, which was, I think, really important uh, for, for the panel. Um, so right now I am going to, um, we can just all turn off our cameras and our next panel will be uh, at quarter past two, so in 15 minutes. Um, I'm not going to close the meeting, so we can just all turn cameras and microphones off and then come back in 15 minutes. But thank you so much. Maybe a round of applause for um, our amazing speakers. Thank you.